Tonight, our main speaker is Nick. Help me welcome Nick to the stage. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Glad to be here. Where else can you go and get a free bottle of water? Uh, so I want to thank Kirk for inviting Jim and I over here to speak before you. And uh, we appreciate it. Jim didn't mention it, but he has 36 years of sobriety. And uh, next month, if I last till the 19th, I'll have uh, 30 years. So it's great to be here. A couple of things I want to do is thank some people that made this all possible. First of all, the first guy that ever started this meeting years and years ago, Jim was the first speaker at the very first meeting years and years ago, and his name was Ken Henderson. He's passed now, but uh, he did a great job. Matter of fact, in those days, people wore suit and ties to get up here to speak, you know, to show respect. And also, I want to thank Mickey that uh, had the foresight to buy this place safe harbor for you guys, for, for a lot of new people. You know, he wanted to have some a place where people could come and, uh, and enjoy, you know, like a club, that they could come and enjoy the meeting. So let me go ahead and start with uh, what it was like. Uh, and, I, you know, I, I'm going to change it up a little bit. I'd like to tell you about my very first drunk. I was about 12 years old in, in grade school, and I went to a parochial grade school. And I don't know if it was the seventh or eighth grade, but... Uh, a new kid came to town. He was from Italy. Just came over. I lived in Cincinnati and just came into town and I made friends with him and uh, he, he just lived across the street from the school and he invited me home for lunch. And Italians can drink at any age. The kids drink a, a wine at any age and his mother offered me a glass of wine with my lunch. And I thought, well, that's great. And I had a 12-ounce glass of wine with my lunch, and I had two others before, <laughs> before I went back to school. And uh, I took a swing and a nun. <laughs> and I had to go to the Monsignor's office, and unfortunately, I, my dad came and got me you know, out of the mess. But this young boy, and I always feel guilty about this for the rest of my life, was that he got kicked out, expelled from school the first day because of what he just happened to be involved. He didn't know. He couldn't even speak English. So it was one of the first things that happened to me as a drunk, and this is, like I say, at 12 years old. And, and as I grew up, I, re I remember doing really crazy things. I remember I'm from Cincinnati, and I remember going down to Cumberland Falls, and we have this Cumberland Falls. is a beautiful falls, and at night, they, they don't allow people to do it anymore because a lot of people were, have died trying to walk under the falls, behind the falls. And we did it drunk. And I just can't, I mean, I can't describe. After we came back the next day and looked at the, where we went across there behind on this little ledge, behind underneath the, the Cumberland Falls, and made it through. And like I say, that was one of the scariest things after you look at it. Also down in Kentucky, I'm from Cincinnati, it's right across the river. I was down there visiting one of the state parks, and, and we were climbing and really drunk out of my mind and climbed this tower. And it seems impossible, but I fell from the tower backwards and landed on my back. I was just a teenager, about your age. No. Matter of fact, Jim and I are in our 70s, and you know I'm glad that we're here. We brought the average age up to 22 here in the group. But I fell back on my back, 20, I don't know, I'm saying 20 feet, it might have been 15, on my back, landed on my back, you know, could have killed me, but I just got up you know, after a couple minutes and not breathing. I just got up and survived. And so when I look back on some of those things that I did, I, another thing I did was jump from a freeway drunk, and, and now this was later on in my 20s, on, jump from a freeway hoping to land on a grassy spot. You're supposed to say, did I make it? Did I make it? No. I didn't make it, but I did live through it. And... Uh, those are just some of the few things to, to, so you can identify with me that I was a, an alcoholic. And back in the days when I was young and, and uh, in 19, I was drafted. That was back in 19, December 1965 into the service. And uh, back then it was Vietnam. You were headed for Vietnam. And they were drafting every other one, Army, Marines, Army, Marines. So most of the Marines were going directly over there. So it was pretty scary. And luckily I got into a was able to get into a reserve unit, but I served basic training with all, most of the guys were going right to Vietnam, and many of them were killed. 
and I remember how scary it was, and I remember that's when I really start drinking. That's when my drinking really took off, was in the military, because then we drank to get drunk for effect. You know, I mean, I always drank for effect, no question about that. I drank to get drunk. But this is where we concentrated. As soon as we got out of, of you know, doing our Army stuff during the day, we hit the bar and we drank till we passed out. And that's, that's how I really developed into a... Uh, and I did some really crazy things back then, you know, jump, uh, saying things about other people and, and, you know, people taking a swing at me and got in a lot of fights. And the only other thing I can remember distinctly about being in the service was a sergeant major one time made a 12-step call, and I'm only telling you this in retrospect. He made a 12-step call on me and said, it, I thought I was going to get drummed out of the ar Army, you know, with the dishonorable discharge with some of the things I did. But he grabbed me aside and took me in his office and told me he used to drink whiskey all day long out of the side of his, his desk, and what he was doing was get doing a 12-step call. He was trying to tell me that he got joined AA and didn't drink anymore, but I didn't, it didn't even phase me. I just kept going. And I had a, during while this military was going on, I still had a, a good career. I was in sales, marketing. That's where you can lie, you know, a lot to make money. And I, I had a big ego back then, and, and uh, I had to be number one in the, in the salesman. I had to be, we, I sold insurance for a while, and I had to be number one from the company uh, around the country. And I would lie and cheat to people. I can tell you that now. You know, I'm, I'm I used to be totally embarrassed about it, but that's how it was. I'd, I'd say anything to get you to buy my product so that I could get drink more and party more. And I usually worked about, on the average, about five months a year and, and would party, you know, like I say, the other seven months a year. And I had it all. I mean, I had a home in La Mesa in San Diego, and I had a beach house in Mission Beach and a mountain cabin up in the mountains near Julian, and, and uh, I was living high, but I, it, was, it was the inside that was starting to get, you know, what happened to me. And I'll tell you what happened. This is the second part. What, what it was like now what happened is, is that my wife finally said that she threatened to leave me. She said, I'm going to take your nine-year-old son, and we're leaving because you're just, unless you will go to counseling. And I thought for a minute, well... Now, if she left with my son, I could drink all the time, <laughs> you know. And unfortunately, many of our alcoholics, that's how it ends up. They leave their families, leave their families and go out and drink. Uh, but I didn't. I went to counseling, and it worked out. The counselor listened to both of us talk, and she said, well, it's obvious to me. You're an alcoholic. You need to go to meetings. <laughs> I mean, she said, you love each other? You're an alcoholic. You need to go to meetings. So they had this. It was at Kaiser Hospital in San Diego. And they had these meetings. They weren't AA, but they were just meetings that we met on Wednesday night. And we'd just talk about our problems. But that's when I first heard about Alcoholics Anonymous. And that was in, uh, that was in September of 1989, September 19th when I stopped drinking, and I start going to this, this meeting, Drunks Only, in Mission Valley. And uh, they were talking a language I didn't understand. Every word they said, I didn't even under because I wasn't thinking the way they were thinking. You mean care about other people? Wow. What's wrong with you? You know, I mean, I, all I cared about was getting money out of your pocket and putting it in my pocket. You know, I faked empathy. I, faked, I pretended like I cared about you, but I really didn't. So when you start talking about caring about other people and things like that, uh, I didn't understand it at all, about giving it away to keep it. And then I found this uh, step study because after about three or four or five months in the program, I knew I needed more. I knew that just not drinking wasn't enough. And I heard about these steps, the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I thought, well, that's what I need to do. I need more than just to not drink. So we had a formal step study in La Mesa, and it lasted nine months. And we started with 100 people, and by the time and I admitted, came to believe, made a decision on my own without a sponsor, and came to the fourth step where you, you know, start to really take a serious look at yourself, we started out with 200 people. We ended up with 100 on the fourth step. 
50% dropped out. Does that sound right? That's about the average. If you can make it past the fourth and fifth steps, you're in the program. If you're if you're not if you haven't done a fifth step, you're just visiting, because this is the the key step. Now, naturally, I thought I already did steps one, two, and three, but once I I realized when I had, after I was had to go through four and five that I'm going to have to get a sponsor, somebody to tell my fifth step to. I found a sponsor and he made me do those steps over again with him the proper way. And so now. I did the, the steps, uh, I admitted afterwards, and I reworked these vital steps with my sponsor. You know, step one is, it didn't come easy. The problem with me is it was ego. And, uh, you know, I don't know, it may have been your problem. The ego deflation is the part of all the steps, but it was the first one was the step to admit that defeat, that we're, we couldn't drink alcohol. So I learned that my ego, I'm the, that was the mick I thought I was. My ego was telling me that I was this person, and it wasn't the real mick. I never found the real mick till after I worked the steps and, and uh, started, you know, uh, finding out who I really was through steps four and five and, you know, and through the rest of them. So when I did this, the first step in, in, uh, in like I say, in deflating that, in, uh, that ego, it helped me, you got to do the steps in order because they wouldn't make sense if you didn't do them in order. And at number two, I didn't have any debate with religion because I grew up with a spiritual background. The difference is here for finally, I was able to have a God of my own choosing. And I thank Abby Thatcher for, and, uh, and, uh, and Jimmy Burwell forever. Jimmy Burwell, not Abby, but Jimmy Burwell for, for telling Bill he was an atheist and he had to have a God of his own understanding. And, and they argued over that and put that in the third step and 11th step, God as my understanding or our understanding. And when you put that in there, it opens the door for everybody because most of the people I see coming in Alcoholics Anonymous either don't believe in God or have a problem with God or mad at God. So if we can have a God of our understanding, we, it helps you. So that was no problem with step two or three. Because as we understood him, made the big difference with Jimmy Burwell. The fourth step, uh, which I did, really worked hard because I was in this step study and, and wrote down everything. Everything I could. I did the inventories. You know, the, the resentment inventory, the sex inventory, the, all the inventories. And when I had all those inventories, I started to realize who Mick really was. I never knew that before. Like I said, I, my ego was telling me who I was. And what I learned then was that I had to, to do the fifth step and tell that fourth step to somebody else. Sure, to God, to myself, but the, the difficult part was to be able to sit, tell it to somebody else. And I did, I did my fifth step with my sponsor. And um, <clears throat> it wasn't the worst fifth step in the world, but it was to me. Because those were the reasons that I drank. The reasons in my fourth step of what I did to other people were the reason I was drinking. And of course, there are many more. But that was the start, is finding out who Mick was and to finally tell somebody else about it. When I did my fifth step, <clears throat> in a big book, it tells you to, take, to go home for an hour and review those first five proposals. When I did that, and actually while I was doing my fifth step, I had an out-of-body experience, and I've only had one other out-of-body experience in my life, and that was when I watched my son being born. An out-of-body experience is when you're up here looking down, watching it happen, and you feel like you're up here watching it. That's the feeling I got, the relief I got to be able to let that all go. All the reasons things I was drinking over, I was able to tell that to another individual and just let it go. And I really was successful in those first five proposals. When I got to the character defects in step six, uh, all they are is the opposite of the principles of the 12 steps of alcoholics. And that's where we're talking about honesty, hope, faith, things like that. And this is where I had the first, I think the key word in step six is trust. Because I already was sober. God was already providing sobriety for me 
So I know he could help relieve these or relieve these character defects from me, or at least I had to learn to trust. And I think that's what the key word is in step six. And of course, step seven for me was again getting rid of that ego and getting humble again. True humility. And my humility isn't so much with you as another person, but I do get humble before my before God. And so I'll pray and do my morning meditation. And when I when you have these character defects removed, I'm not doing it. I don't have the power to relieve these character defects. My higher power does. The only thing I can tell you that, and I'm only telling you from my experience, is that when these character defects were removed from me, I could just witness them. Or if I kept screwing up doing the same one over and over, now one of my worst ones was sarcasm. Oh, I was a killer on sarcasm. I could cut your down being sarcastic, then smile afterwards so you wouldn't punch me. Sarcasm was my worst. It took several years. I didn't work on it, but here's what happened. I was, every time I was sarcastic, I thought, oh, that's right. I don't think I, God wants me to be that way. I don't think I want to be that way, sarcastic. And all of a sudden, I guess a couple years later, I really did care about you, and I wasn't sarcastic anymore. It just finally, it's in God's time, not my time. I don't decide when these character defects are going to be lifted. So also what trust takes is, and I wrote this down, is it takes action and vulnerability. Because if I'm trusting in my higher power, I'm no longer the king shit anymore. i got to realize that i got to be vulnerable, that God's my higher power. And I think that's what it takes. At least that's what it took for me. Now, eight and nine, you can, you can kind of combine the two, steps eight and nine. But I count, I count eight and eight as a very important step because it, it takes a lot of willingness. Because when, you're, when you uh, try to clean up that wreckage of the past and pay back, well, you pay back what you owe. It's not your money, you know, especially on financial amends. But, but I know uh, when I was doing my A step, I had a 10-year-old son, like I told you, he was 10 by now. And I was doing my A step in, at my house. Or no, I wasn't there. That's right. I, but I was in the process of doing my A step. And my son was home, 10 year old boy, and two bikers, big bikers, come to the door. We put, bring, come up in their Harleys, and they come up to the door and said, Where's Mick? And this little boy, 10 year old boy, Brian, he says, He's not here, he's at work. And they said, Well, he owes us money. We'll be back. So I get home later off work, and Brian tells me that these guys came in. Big bikers, oh, they have chains going this way, chains going that way. They're tough. And they, you owe them money, and they'll be back tomorrow. Man, talk about doing a thorough eighth step. <laughs> I was up all night trying to figure out who did I screw now. And I wrote, and I did a thorough A step because I wrote down every everybody I possibly could have. Now I was ready for him. I had a knife ready under the blanket, right on the table there. I didn't care who it was. And they showed up the next day. It was a joke. It was, one of them was an old friend of mine from high school. They just stopped by to, you know, to, and they did that and it scared my little boy, and of course scared me. So, wow, I, you know, I'm really thankful for that because I was able to clean up that wreckage or get ready to clean up the wreckage. One other thing I want to say about step eight is that I sponsor an awful lot of guys, so does Jim, and uh, one of the things I tell them is that when we do that A step, we don't wait to the nice step to plan your amends. Because we may not do all your amends, but we need to plan how we're going to do it, how, how we're going to make that amends, no matter who it is, family, friends, money, whatever it is. I want you to plan it out. If that's where that willingness comes in. So A step is important. You've got to already have it in your mind that you're going to pay everybody back or you're going to make those amends to them. And by, also when I did my ninth step, I remember that I, did, I, went, I went to the graveyard, made the graveyard amends to my mom, you know, told her that maybe I wasn't the son that she would have liked to be while she was alive. And, you know, because she was gone now. You know, other, some people write letters. But where I got the biggest relief, I think, in the ninth step for me was making those financial amends. Sure, I didn't want to pay back the money, but it wasn't my money. I conned them out of it or cheated them out of it some way. It was their money. 
So I went back and paid all those. It took a while to pay back all those nice step amends. But I never got a better feeling than being able to clear that away because nine step is those uh, relationships you have with other and Bill Wilson always used to say that people drank over feelings of better than or less than and this is where I felt even now I felt comfortable and I could look you in the face because I did those now they call them the nine step promises if you read those promises after you're sober for a few months you'll say wow those things are starting to come true in my life that's what happened for me so then uh what I had to do was uh, continue that with the 10th step, and I still do that today uh, as I you know, do that inventory. I don't do a daily inventory so much anymore as I do the spot check inventory, and I'll give you an example. Uh, down in, I have a, <clears throat> a home up here, and I, and I winter down in uh, Apache Junction, and we have, we have, we have a big uh, resort with billiard hall and everything, and well, some guy asked me to start a, a pool tournament with all the people, and I, I, I started a pool tournament. But some of the older guys that had been around a while didn't like the fact that here I'm. I was, I was new in the park about, seven, about ten years ago. And uh, one, the first guy that came in started mumbling, you know, and Danny didn't like it. And then the sec, second guy said something, and that's the guy I jumped on. Now here it is, Mr. Serenity cussed him out. One end to the other. I lost it. It's, uh, it's, I, I, used to, I call it when the streets come back. You know, it's when you're blindsided. And that's what so, that spot check inventory works so well for me in the 10th step. Now, I went, I, after that happened, I cussed him out. I mean, I really, I called him out to fight. He, I found out he was an ex-cop, so it would have been a good fight, I think, you know. When I, I went to my regular meeting, I was headed off right after that, and this one woman said, to, when I went in the meeting, she said, how are you, Mick? And I said, I'm not fine. I need to go back and make amends. See, I can't wait till the evening to review my day. I know now, after the years of sobriety, when I screw up, and I have to go back and make that amends. So I went back and looked for that guy. It's a big park, I mean, with hundreds of people that live in there in homes. And I, for about an hour, I just happened to run across him, and I made my amends. He didn't take it well, but I did my part. I cleaned up my side of the street. I made the amends, and I went to everybody in that, that was in that room, a couple dozen guys, and made my amends to each and every one of them and told them I was sorry about the way I acted, and I hoped that that wouldn't continue, that I'd ne that would never happen again. And, of course, it hasn't. That was about 10 years ago. So what it comes down to is I hate to make amends. I hate to do it. I mean, it's embarrassing. It's humbling. And I think that's part of the reason why maybe I don't screw up so much. I mean, you know, sure, I try to be spiritual, but I mean, I really do hate to make the amends. So it's, it's great that, that I can live a better life just because I'm scared. Oh, anyway, I don't know. Now, 11th step is really what I want to talk about because that's what I spend most of my time uh, talking about. I'm, I'm asked to speak all over the country, all over the world when, when I'm traveling. And, and uh, the first meetings I look for in a town is I look for 11 step meetings. And after that, I look for literature meetings, either big book or 12 and 12. And the reason why I like 11 steps so much is because if we seek, what, what they have here is we sought, we sought conscious contact with our higher power. And that's the means, the way I do it. I know if I make my conscious contact with my higher power that I'll stay sober that day. So I do the morning meditation, and I do the, you know, sometimes the inventory at night. And then, uh, in a way, is a combination of doing the two. But I think that's where I think what keeps me sober today. And I thought for just maybe like three minutes explain what I do. I'll just tell you what I do. When I get ready for a meditation, I'll get very comfortable in a comfortable position in the morning, and I'll think of a, a scenic spot, or I'll be at a beautiful place on the ocean or, or up here in the mountains. I'm a hiker three days a week, and I have all the, all the trails I've been on. And I'll visualize that beautiful place, whether it's in the mountains with a stream or, or on the ocean, and I'll put that visual in my mind. And after that, and I'll concentrate on that, 
And I'll tell you a little bit what, later why. Once I can visualize that, that's relaxing. And then I start my deep breathing. And it's important to me, the breathing. In, out. And I use the whole diaphragm. You know, I'll use all the way in and then use my last breath and get it all the way out and all the way in. And the reason why I do that to, to start with is I used to meditate and forget to breathe. <laughs> I don't know. I shouldn't, you don't want that to happen. So I go do the deep breathing, breathe in, breathe out. And I also do the, when I do the meditation, I have a mantra when I breathe in and out. My mantra is God in, Mick out. God in, anger out. God in, fear out. Ooh, that's the big one. So that's my mantra. When I do that, for instance, the fear, I just feel like everything's been lifted from me. I'm in total, beautiful, scenic uh, seascape in my mind where I'm right there. I'm breathing, I'm concentrating on my breathing, and I'm concentrating on my mantra. Now, the advantage of this is I'm tricking myself so I'm not thinking about what's for dinner or you know where I'm going to be tomorrow. I'm concentrating on listening for the answers. And all of you know that praying is talking to God, listen, meditation is listening. So there's two ways to meditate. You can meditate and concentrate on a tree, for example, and meditate how beautiful the tree is and the leaves and, and how imagine the roots going deep in the ground and how what beautiful that tree is. I don't meditate that way. I listen. I open my mind to God. I just completely go blank on thought. So I'm tricking my mind, and it works. And if I have come back, and of course we all do, even, even the Buddhist. The Buddhists use a bell. Every once in a while they have a bell they'll ring to bring them back into their, their meditation. So once I do that, I'm making that conscious contact and I'm opening up to, to any ideas from my higher powers. I do the prayers. I, one thing I forgot to say is I do the prayers before I go to do the meditation, after I do the breathing, is I'll do the set-aside prayer. I'll do the 11-step prayer, of course, St. Francis prayer, and of course the third and the, the seven-step prayer. And the set-aside prayer is a simple one. It's where I, I just ask that God uh, help me set aside what I think I know about me, AA, and especially about God. If I can set that aside, I'll be open to anything, anything new, any new ideas. Now, step 12 is a spiritual awakening is the goal. After we've completed, he even says it in step 12, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. It's... it's unbelievable how many of us, millions of us in Alcoholics Anonymous have been able to have this spiritual experience, a spiritual awakening and be able to change from the inside, become a different person. I became a different person, became Mick. In the past, we didn't have anything like that. What do you think drunks did before? You know, they did belladonna treatment, you know, with drugs or they uh, shock treatment. There wasn't any way to get sober for centuries until... Bill Wilson was able to put this whole concept together that, have, that, that, that we can have a, uh, you know, a, a problem of the a disease of the mind and the body and then a solution of the spiritual awakening. So once we do those 11 steps, 12 steps, the 12th step is we, become, we have that spiritual awakening and become the person that we always want to be. And also the 10, 11, and 12 are growth steps or maintenance steps. And the reason why is because we can't just... Get sober and not work. I found that the, by working, we grow in, in the Alcoholics Anonymous. We become better people by doing steps 10, 11, and 12. And that's, I stick to those. You know, I used to think, what's so spiritual about step 10? But step 10 is that contact with other people. You know, if I screw up, I want to let you know that I'm, I'm going to try to improve on that situation. You know, I don't do that again. Because... Sure, I could sit and pray and meditate to God in step 11. But, again, like Bill's, Bill Wilson always thought, it's the contact with other people is the real what brings a lot of people down, you know, those feelings that we have about other people. So if I know I'm doing the best I can for other people, then I know, uh, and I, that's where it comes true in my 12th step, too. Right now I'm sponsoring two 24-year-olds, you know, and we're through the fifth step, working, working sixth and seven right now. 
I generally I sponsor about you know half a dozen guys either up here or down when I'm down in uh, Apache Junction. One thing I wanted to mention too is that I didn't understand this, and I just want to, I hope you can get this, is that spiritual growth had to come first before physical and financial. I thought, I get sober, now I can go back to work, I'll make a lot of money, I can get in shape, you know, start working out. You got need that spiritual growth first, and first and forever is the spiritual growth, because that's the only thing that's important to me now. The rest, can anything can happen. You know, we could die tomorrow, we could go broke tomorrow, it doesn't matter. It's that spiritual growth is where we end, end up finally ending up. Um, one example of um, that is um, I was in San Diego and I had this T-Mobile one to put up this tower on my mountain property. And they never did put it up, but they paid me $1,200 a month for two years just planning to do it. And it happened to be when I started on my world travel around the world, just a vacation with my wife and I, and that extra 1200 came in pretty handy. But you know what? That was the financial part. But what it was before that happened, and I was starting to think about the money and all that stuff, I realized, hey, I'm getting away from the spirituality of this program. I need to up my meetings, and I need to start making more conscious contact and becoming spiritual and start giving back. And when I start doing that, that's when things happen, like T-Mobile and all those kind of deals. So uh, it's, you know, you can, you'll hear lots of stories like that of, of you know, how people do really well. And uh, I, did, I did, too. I retired in 20, 2000, 19 years ago at 55. And I retired to world travel. We traveled all over the world. And, of course, I went to a lot of meetings. I think there's about, I think there's about 2,300,000 AAs, maybe a little bit more, in the world. I met about half of them. Well, maybe not all that many. But, so I've been everywhere. And, a matter of fact, just imagine, back then, I, I went to 600 brand-new meetings where you walk in the door for the first time, all over the country, all over the world. Now it's up over 700. I love to go to different meetings and see how other people are, are doing it. Uh, for the last five years, I've been spending summers here in Prescott in my home here and winters down in Apache Junction. And before that, we did, uh, we'd travel anywhere that was warm in the winter. I don't like your cold winters here. Uh, San Diego, Mexico, Florida, we would spend the, the winters. And uh, in my travels, also in the motorhome, I mean, we went, we've been all over the country. We went to New Bedford up there in, in Upper New York where Bill Wilson was born. And, or not, and we were in New Bedford, but in Vermont, went to his house where he was born there. And I remember um, I thought while I was in uh, Vermont, uh, East Dorset, Vermont, where Bill was born, and he was actually born in the back where a, where a bar was. And now it's not a bar, but it's, it's a big room now where 75 people gather and they have meetings. And I thought, what a wonderful place I could lead this meeting and be such a dream. And this guy started talking to me, and I found out later that he was interviewing me to see if I could lead the meeting. <laughs> and he asked me to lead the meeting, and I did for 75 people at, at Bill Wilson's house. And I, I felt touched. Now, Bill Wilson was, you know, he had a lot of problems other than, uh, you, you know, drinking. And I'm not really eulogizing Bill, but he's the one that helped start this whole program. And... That's what I think, that's what I'm so happy about, is that we have something now that we can grab onto it's to get sober. So I've been to his house there, and I've been to his house up in New York, where he and Lois lived uh, all the way to uh, when he died, and then also till when she died later on. You know, another, she lived to ripe old age. And uh, I think Bill was 76 when he passed away in 1971. So I've traveled all over, and, and um, I've been to the different places. I even stopped back in, in, um, in Manchester, Vermont, near East Dorset, where uh, Ebby Thatcher used to live in their summer home. Ebby was Bill's sponsor in the old Oxford group, if you guys didn't know about that. And that was the group that you know kind of came before AA, but Bill's the one that really put, like I say, the spiritual awakening together for it. One of the guys also I met in a, in a program was a guy named Bill Borcher. And Bill was a guy that wrote uh, My Name is Bill W. It was a movie in the 1990s. 
And he also wrote the Lois Wilson story, When Love is Not Enough. And I got to talking to Bill, and he spent hours with Lois uh, with, about what Bill was like in Alcoholics Anonymous and how it started. So I really got a handle on the history of what happened early on. And uh, I remember uh, that movie, if any of you have seen it, it was back in the 90s. Uh, the Bill Wilson story was really depicted exactly like it happened because... He, Bill, Bill Borcher copied right out off the tapes from what Lois told him and, and of course, what he read, too. So the, the, towards the end of the movie, I, after, the, after this meeting that Bill Borcher was talking to us at the, in, this, uh, in this little storage bin down in, uh, down in South Carolina, uh, what was it called? A uh, real tiny town in South Carolina. And their meetings, they were hold, held in storage bins. And uh, I thought, wow, wow, this is the guy that wrote these books. And I asked him, I said, after the meeting, he came out to talk to me, and he said, I said to him, I said, Bill, you know, there's a scene in that movie, and, you know, probably most of you haven't seen it, so I don't want to blow the movie for you, but at the end of the movie, uh, Bill was sitting in, a, in a, uh, a meeting in California. He came, went all the way out to California, and uh, he was with Lois, his wife, and he got up, and this guy introduced. He says, okay, anybody visiting? And Bill gets up and says, yeah, that's Bill and Lois. And they say, okay, Bill and Lois, have a seat. They didn't recognize him. And he said, Bill and Lois from New York? Oh, yeah, Bill and Lois from New York. Have a seat. They didn't get it. And, and uh, so anyway, that's how, what, how the scene went. And Lois never uh, lived long enough to see the movie, but he read the transcript to her because he, he wrote the movie. And he read that to her, and she laughed. She said, Bill would have loved that. He would have loved that because back then, you know, he was, people thought he had this high ego, but he was very, very humble, very spiritual by, you know, towards the end of his, his sobriety. So those are the kind of things that uh, I was able to be given as, as gifts in the program. It's, it's an inside job. And that's what I like to, you know, to tell, let you know is it's an inside job. It's not something that uh, I can grow on the outside or, you know, I can get better uh, physically or mentally, like I said before, or, or uh, financially. I became a different person by taking these 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And so I highly recommend them to you. Find, uh, if you need to get a, a sponsor, uh, what I recommend, and, you know, of course, you can get somebody new if you want, I recommend instead of the blind leading the blind, to find somebody that has some sobriety, some years of sobriety. And also, not only years of sobriety, but somebody you like what they're sharing about. They, in other words, you, you, like, you can relate to what they're saying when they share. So when you can relate to what they're saying, and they've got, say, a few years or more sobriety, not somebody new in the program, then the hardest part is to ask them. Ask somebody. To sponsor you and it's a compliment believe me it's a compliment if, and if they can't do it they'll tell you but most people will be glad to help you I know when I first started out sponsoring years and years ago I I used to have to go to my sponsor to find out what okay he, he did this he said this now what do I do and I, I always had to stay a page ahead of the sponsees so I, it got me into the book, you know, when I was new. You know, I said, oh, yeah, I got to study. Now, if he's on step one, I got to kind of get on step two here before, before he does and tell him my experience. And that's really all it is, is telling your experience and strength and hope to a newcomer. Because you, what you have, and even if it's only a couple months, you have something, maybe you don't have to sponsor anybody, but even that couple months is more than somebody that I heard a lot of brand new people that just came in the, in the meeting today. If they look at you and say, yeah, he's got two months, I, don't, I could probably do that. They look at me, Jim, 30, 36 years and say, no, I, that's a long time. You know, it's not forever. It's one day at a time. We learned that. The last thing I wanted to talk about was living in the now. And it's not strictly AA. It's just that we were taught here. It's a way of life. And what I've learned here is that I used to live in the past. I used to live in the future plan things. I was in sales, so I'd plan out my future all these years ahead, what I was going to do, and I was never in the present. And what I learned in here is one of the greatest gifts was living in the now. And it's, it's part of the AA whole philosophy is that 
once we start did that nine step and you know we went through that and let go everything go from the past we can let that go and move on and just clean up our, our, our messes as we go in the tenth step and try to stay that make that conscious contact we can live for today and it doesn't matter what we do so much today because if we if we have a great day today and do the best we can do just think of all those great tomorrows we're going to have so you just put your best effort now get sober stay sober it's everything else is going to work out if we could just continue to make that conscious contact so it's it's really been a pleasure to get up here and, and talk with you again i've been at this meeting several times and uh, I just love to be able to share, and I'll be out front if you have any any questions or comments. But it's uh, again, it's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you.